Uh, my name's Joe. Uh, I'd just like to acknowledge that we're meeting here on Aboriginal land, the land of the Boron and Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. I pay my respects to the elders, past, present, and future, to recognise that sovereignty has never been ceded and is practised daily. Um, so I'm here just to introduce someone I'm sure needs no introduction. Jack Halberstam is Professor of English and Gender Studies at Columbia University. He's the author of many books, including Skin Shows. Female Masculinity, The Drag King's Book with Della Grace Volcano, In a Queer Time and Place, The Queer Art of Failure, Gaga Feminism, and from 2018, Trans, A Quick and Quirky Account of Gender Variability. His work is fundamentally and necessarily interdisciplinary, and it's had an incredible influence on my own, which has been in many ways concerned and inspired with this provocation he made, Jack, in 1998. The idea that only transsexuals experience the pain of a wrong body shows an incredible myopia about the trials and tribulations of the many forms of perverse embodiment. I'm sure you're going to teach us some more about um, different kinds of perverse embodiment tonight. So I'll end by saying only this, that Jack's work has changed the way that we think about and understand gender. So please join me in welcoming. All right, uh, thank you so much, Joe, and um, really thank you for uh, including me in this event. I'm really delighted to be here, and I know that there are some people here from uh, the Critical Animal Studies uh, Network, and uh, I hope you're not too angry with this talk. Um, it, I think it pushes a few buttons, and I'm, I'm willing to do that, um, and then in the hopes that we have a, a fun conversation uh, afterwards. Um, let, so let me just give you a sense of where we're going to go, uh, define some of my terms, and then um, I'll just move through three sections, each of which is a, is a bit of a provocation, about the relationship between the animal and the human uh, as figured through uh, work in the area of queer studies and sexuality studies. So a lot of animal study doesn't necessarily come to us through sexuality studies, but this project absolutely um, does. So I guess I'm picking up on uh, an idea of anarchy that sort of extends the notion of the political from just this solely human domain into a shared domain between animals and humans. And at the, in the last part of the paper, I'm actually going to ask what it would look like if we were able to recognize that animals are often in revolt against us and that there's a kind of anarchistic refusal, if you like. It's not organization, although Chicken Run, which is not really animals, it's animation, but in Chicken Run, the, you know, there's a whole chapter of that film about the chickens being organized. But generally, we might say that animals resist uh, human domination in all kinds of ways that are quite disorganized and therefore escape uh, our discernment. So I'm going to get to that, but I'm going to argue along the way that there's been a variety of intimate relations that people have taken up to animals, some domestic and some wild, but that in recent years we've moved much more towards pet owning, and in pet owning comes our strictest form of oppression of animal life. So rather than seeing um, the human oppression of animals only through the meat industry uh, or only through you know, the plundering of resources in the animal world, or only through hunting, what if we actually understood that our demand for intimacy from animals is part and parcel of our domination uh, of them? And here I think, in some ways, I'm probably at odds with people like Donna Haraway, and I'll, I'll say more um, about that uh, later on, who sometimes sort of romanticizes or sentimentalizes the relationship to the animal um, in this uh, notion of a companion species. Um, we're the ones who think that dogs are a companion species, but what do dogs think? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to try to actually answer that question at the end. So three sections that will just sort of lay out this um, argument about the oppression of animals through intimacy rather than you know, adhering to the more intuitive argument, which would be that we rescue animals from oppression by bringing them into the home, and that in our intimate relations with animals, 
we set up this kind of extra human domain in which we love animals, we partner with animals, and we are in this companionship relationship. I'm not sure about that, and I want to give you some examples of how we might partner with animals, but also how pet, uh, the, the domain of pet owning has become a new mode of management. Okay. So the three sections of the book, and they're all from uh, my book on wildness that I'm finishing up. In the first section, I look at a weird group of writers who have mostly been characterized as gay from the beginning of the 20th century, who were fetishistically in love with wild birds that they seeked, they sought to train and domesticate, but were happily unable to. In the second part, I want to look at this not very interesting film, um, The Secret Life of Pets, um, if only to suggest that even in our cutest narratives, we do recognize the possibility that animals don't want to live with us and might be an open revolt. And then in the last section, I'm going to launch a full-fledged critique of dog owning in particular. Okay, so now you know where we're going. Um, so the first, uh, so here's, you know, people are like, what do you mean by wild? Well, I mean a lot of different things by wild, but when it comes to animals, we tend to mean <coughs> an animal is wild to the extent that it is not able to be tamed. And the, the category of feral in particular means is often applied to wild birds where you might be able to train a hawk, but the minute that you are finished with that training, the hawk reverts to being feral. So feral is a term that's often used for animals that cannot be brought under the sway of human uh, dominion. And in that category, I think we can find some of the meaning or some of the way in which I'm trying to use the term wild. And here's a good definition. Wild, not under or not submitting to control or restraint. Taking or disposed to take one's own way, uncontrolled, primarily of animals and hence of persons and things, with various shades of meaning, acting or moving freely without restraint, going at one's own will, unconfined, unrestricted. And I think you can find a lot of different versions of wild in them, many of which I am referring to uh, in the book on wildness. Um, a primary text, obviously, and this is the epigraph for my book, uh, is from Morris uh, Sendak's Where the Wild Things uh, Are. And I think this book is so amazing because it taps into the way that the wild is sort of primal territory for humans and particularly for the child and is the imagined space as it is for animals outside of their home. So just as we can imagine through texts like Where the Wild Things Are that children may not happily fall under our sway even as they are born into domestic households, children willfully rebel against domestic constraint and just think back to the last time you were around a two-year-old and you'll know that that is true, okay? <laughs> Similarly, other creatures that we share domiciles with and that we imagine that we are helping and taking care of may similarly be in open rebellion against us. So when the child is in open rebellion against us, we imagine that they just don't know what's good for them. <laughs> Uh, and we have many, many narratives about how they're no good on their own and we have to do this stuff and it's for your own good, right, is the narrative that we tell. But when, of course, it's for the social good that we manage the children, uh, restrain them and pull them out of the wild and into the human via the process of domestication. So we do that with children, but we also do it with certain kinds of animals. All right. So section one, let me tell you about this group of writers, and one writer in particular, who fell in love with birds um, and, and engaged in falconry, not to own pets, but in order to take up a very sexual and erotic relationship to wildness. And this is uh, from one chapter uh, of my book. And of course, the absolutely quintessential modernist statement um, by uh, Yeats that we have inherited involves this relationship, a kind of sadomasochistic relationship between falcons uh, and falconers. Uh, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Uh, should tell us something about the uh, centrality of this fantasy of the relationship between the falconer and the falcon to modern life, even as it seems to come to us from uh, ancient life, because of course falconry is a very old art going back to you know well before the 12th century and so on. 
The term that I'm going to pull from these narratives and use to define what I'm calling an epistemology of the ferox um, is designed to suggest that the, 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 the people that I'm talking about in their desire for these wild birds are articulating a different desire uh, that falls outside of the homo heterobinary and is much more enclosed by a relationship to the domestic wild binary. So while we have a tendency to believe that everyone from about 1890s on falls into the category of either the hetero or the homo with some sort of transpermutation attached, in fact, there were lots and lots of people between 1890 and, say, 1940 didn't recognize themselves at all in that binary and found other vectors for identification, one of which was wildness. Falconry is weirdly sexual. I don't know if you've thought about this before, but it's a very fetishistic uh, um, practice, and it involves hoods, uh, beautifully handcrafted hoods, mind you, that uh, you know you compare, com could compare to. Um, I think it was was it Nancy Stein who, in the 1960s, made those beautiful black leather hoods. A, a feminist artist. Do you remember? Does anyone remember? Anyway, I think it, Nancy something. Um, and but of course, uh, S and M practices involve also <coughs> handcrafted hoods. There are also jesses. Falcons often wear chaps that then are attached to uh, jesses, which are the leather straps that the falconer uh, ties around their wrist. And the relationship between the falcon and the falconer is both the game, the Freudian game of Fort Dar, um, but also the S&M practice of uh, sort of testing the limits uh, the, where the falcon is sort of cast as the bottom and the trainer uh, is the top. And this is exactly how one author described the relationship between another author and his bird. And so um, in, in the last five, three years, this book has become immensely popular. And I wonder if people here have read it. How many people have read H's for Hawk? Yeah, absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous, amazing book uh, written by Helen MacDonald, who wrote um, a book already on uh, the falcon for the animal series out of, I think it's said, Books. I can't remember uh, the, the company that publishes these beautiful animal books, and she wrote the um, book on Falcon. Uh, and when her father died, I guess in 2014, something like that, um, she decided as a process of mourning to send away for a hawk. So she orders a hawk, a female hawk, um, uh, which I think is called maybe a Merlin, and she uh, uh, trained it. And over the course of training it, she works through her mourning for her father. So this whole process of training the hawk also becomes a battle with her grief over the death of her father. But along the way, she reads everything she can on falconry and goes back to the books that she had read as a child on falconry. And one comes to the fore, which is T.H. White's book, The Goshawk. Teach White is mostly known for the Sword, in the Sword in the Stone and the King Arthur books, um, and is known as a kind of minor figure in English literature. But he was an immensely popular writer at the height of his Arthurian uh, narratives. Uh, and he was quite known to not be heterosexual. Okay? Uh, when the writer Sylvia Townsend Warner came to write his biography, and she was chosen to write it precisely because she herself was a lesbian, and the publishers thought that she would have some insight into his identity. She herself was not sure whether to classify him as gay, and described the process of having to write this biography as akin to wrestling with an octopus. She, and that's as close as she came to actually naming what his sexuality was. And I'll tell you a bit more about his sexuality as we go, but let's just bracket whether he was homosexual. For Helen MacDonald, however, he was homosexual. And this is the issue that I want to take with her book while I'm totally um, in love with this book. I think the narrative that she tells about T.H. White and his relationship to his bird is wrong. Because she thinks that he is subsuming uh, his homosexuality and projecting it onto the bird precisely because he can't express it uh, through same-sex relations. That, I believe, is a misreading of the desire that he harbors for the hawk. So let's sort of dig into that a little bit. 
So, but first, there are the two books side by side. Um, both of them are, you know, really about mourning and loss and melancholy and alternative desires that run through the relationship <coughs> to a wild thing. And grief here is being compared to a kind of wildness that can't be tamed and that you have to sit in relationship to. But there are some other Hawk books that you may not know about um, and that uh, MacDonald mentions but just in passing. And they flesh out this narrative that I'm offering about the fact that these men, mostly, who wanted to be in relationship to these wild birds were not gay. They were expressing, I argue in my book, an, a, a simple desire for wildness. Okay? So here's one of them. Uh, J.A. Baker, has anyone read The Peregrine? Okay, J.A. Baker was not a, a nature writer. He was just a local librarian. And one winter, a few years before he died, uh, as, at a fairly young age, he spent the winter following a, a mating pair of peregrines. And the book is now has been revived because it's like reading a prose poem. It's a, an unbelievable piece of writing that tries to capture in language what it would mean to be a falcon or a hawk. But along the way, he imagines that he is becoming hawk in this really Deleuzean way. And the end of the book finds him crouched over some prey that a, a, a one of the peregrines has dropped, and he's preparing to eat it. And at that point, he's, he realizes that he has lost his relationship to the human, and he has, he has merged with the bird. And that, in the end, was, was his quest was not to train the bird, or to capture the bird, but to become it. Yet another hawk book. Again, one, and these books are not often placed in relationship to each other, and are not even talked about in gay literature. Uh, this one is introduced by Michael Cunningham, you know, the guy who wrote The Hours. The first edition was introduced by Edmund White, two of the best known gay writers of their generation. But is it a gay book, okay? It's a book, about a bachelor who's visiting a married couple, who's visiting his friend, a single woman, when a married couple arrive, and on the arm of the wife is a hawk, and that's it. The story is all about everyone's relationship to this hawk, and it becomes very clear that the man, who may or may not be gay, the bachelor, is identified with the hawk, and he sees the woman's attempt to tame the hawk as being the embodiment of marriage, and he sets himself up against marriage against the couple form as the bachelor who is like the falcon. At the same time, the wife is weirdly masculine and dominates her husband. And she too identifies with the hawk as a particularly rapacious female wild bird who is constantly sort of mantling and flying at um, the males in the room. So she, her perverse gender is expressed through the hawk. And then the husband is sort of castrated in relationship to the hawk. And that's all the story is. It's one day, and the hawk flies away, and then it comes back. And people imagine killing each other, and then off they go. Okay? <laughs> that said, Edmund White calls it the best gay novella ever written, Okay, <laughs> that no one knows about. So what I'm trying to point to is a subculture of literature about hawks and falconry and wildness and sexuality that dare not speak its name, but whose name is not gay, okay? But whose name might be Ferox, and I'll say why in a moment. Finally, did any, is anyone here of the age that I am who would have had to read that book in high school? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, A Kestrel for a Knave is the British equivalent of uh, Catcher in the Rye for a certain generation, and this was the book that we were given to explain to us class society in Britain in the 70s. And uh, Barry Hines' book is about a working class lad who's gonna, whose future is to go down the mines with his brother. But he spots a kestrel on the moors and he goes and climbs up to the kestrel nest and finds a kestrel and brings it down and tames it, or doesn't tame it, but trains it. And he asks his teacher to come and watch. And his teacher comes and watch, watches him uh, um, fly the bird around and the teacher sort of then says that he sees something in the boy because the boy has taken the first step 
towards bourgeois existence, which is the management of the wild and of nature. And so this becomes the, you know, I see if I have the quote uh, from the book now. But the, um, you know, the, the teacher says to him something like, so remarkable how you've trained the hawk. And he says, oh, I haven't trained it. Um, it's wild and it doesn't listen to anyone. I just am offering it meat. But the teacher believes that the boy has trained the hawk. And that's all it takes for him to see something in the boy. Now, it doesn't end well, you'll remember. Uh, the, the brother kills the hawk because the hawk represents the younger brother's um, root out of working class existence. Um, but there's still a sense at the end of the book that if the hierarchy of the world is properly managed, you will climb out of your working class existence, a kestrel for a knave. Where does that come from? It comes from the book, book of St. Albans from 1486, which was one of the, the uh, golden ages of falconry. And it, the relationship to falconry described the class system, which is why it's taken up then later on in that 20th century novel. So an eagle for an emperor, a grafalcon for a king, a peregrine for a prince, a sacker for a knight, a merlin for a lady, a gossip for a yeoman, that's T.H. White, a sparrowhawk for a priest, and a kestrel for a knave. So there it is, you know, the, the boy in the book uh, who has the kestrel. It's the appropriate bird for his class status but his ability to train it marks the beginning of his class mobility. And I wanted to give you, just to go back to J.A. Baker for a moment, I wanted to give you a sense of the language of that crazy, amazing book, uh, which Helen MacDonald doesn't like. She thinks it's too preoccupied with death. And several times in H's for Hawk, she, she says she wants to move away from this book. But what Baker recognizes in the Hawk is that the Hawk has two desires. Um, to hunt and to feed, and there is nothing else. So it's sort of like what Lee Edelman describes as the death drive in relationship to uh, queer identity. But here it is, this idea to slough off the human. He said, I've always longed to be part of the outward life, to be out there at the edge of things, to let the human taint wash away in emptiness and silence as the fox sloughs his smell into the cold and worldliness of water, to return to town a stranger, wandering flushes a glory that fades with arrival. What? Right? The book is like that. It's just uh, this immersion <coughs> in a world of nature that he crafts the language for um, in order to try <coughs> to use language to move away from the human. Now, most people from animal studies will know that language is often seen as the barrier between the human and the animal. But what Baker's trying to do is make language properly strange to try to capture in the in the line itself, sometimes the flight of the hawk, but also to position the human away from humanity in that Thoreauian way and alongside uh, an animal life that is utterly foreign. So let's go to T.H. Uh, White then. Um, there was, the Book of St. Alban didn't have a word for T.H. White, uh, but we, we might call him a chicken hawk. Okay, so the sparrow hawk is the, the bird for the priest. The name that we've given to an older man who's interested in young boys is interestingly chicken hawk, you know. So we have, we do recognize that there's something queer in this relationship to falconry, um, but this particular term doesn't make it into the uh, taxonomy uh, earlier given. So. Uh, I guess the only way to describe T.H. White's um, uh, s understanding of his own sexuality is in relationship to this term, feral. So he writes at one point about uh, Lord Lancel uh, Sir Lancelot in one of his Arthurian uh, books. Um, he says, oh no, he's reading a book about falconry, and he, he, he reads that as soon as you've trained the bird and it gets away from you, it goes back to being feral. He said the word feral had a kind of magical potency which allied itself with two other words, ferocious and free, fairy, fay, aerial, and other discreditable alliances ranged themselves behind the great cord of ferox. And that's where I want to pull this idea of an epistemology of the ferox, because these are incredible terms. Fairy, as you know, uh, is you know used for a sort of otherworldliness in Ireland, but it's also become a favorite term for describing feminine men. 
Um, Fei is an interesting word. It really means that moment, the, the period before death, that a body goes into a strange kind of agitation. That's what the word Fei means. But it's applied to gay men to suggest that there's something unnatural in the way that the male body is being inhabited by a feminine uh, spirit. And then Ariel suggesting a different medium in which the body lives. So White did not, did not use the word homosexual. Uh, he sometimes used the term ambisexual, but he mostly used the term ferox. So I want to reach back to the 1930s when he was writing this book and pull that term forward and ask what would happen if we looked across the 20th century for figures who could be described as inhabiting an epistemology of ferox. The way that that, uh, one way in which that played out for T.H. White was in, not only in his relationships to wild birds, but also in his relationship to his dog, Brownie. And that dog was his most significant relationship in his life. And when he died, he wrote to a friend and he said, you must try to understand that I am and will remain entirely without wife or brother or sister or child, and that Brownie, my dog, supplied more than the place of these to me. We loved each other more and more every year, and he was inconsolable after the loss of his dog. So White lived a very isolated uh, existence, um, partly because his particular desires had no language in the world that he lived in. Um, and that the way that Helen MacDonald describes him, um, and she's brilliant on wildness, she says things like, wild things are made from human histories, uh, but this is her, her you know, summary of White. White thought he could tame the hawk without breaking its natural spirit, but then she's always critiquing him as a bad falconer, which is interesting because he's also a bad sexual subject. Uh, all he's done is try to break it over and over again. And then this. Many of our classic books on animals were by gay writers who wrote of their relations with animals in lieu of human loves of which they could not speak. And this is where I just simply disagree. And instead... Uh, I want to propose um, that White, whose, whose list of desires was summarized in a letter he wrote to a former pupil, um, saying that it is good to have sex as much as you can in your life, and you should have it with, certainly with women, but with men too, and animals, and furniture. Uh, furniture, yes, cabinets, he mentioned. Um, and he suggested that the great relations and the great loves in his life were for boys and animals. Now, there, even in the 30s, there was no possibility of expressing such desires. And so as far as Helen MacDonald is concerned, he simply reroutes those desires into his relationship with his hawk and his dog. But I think that, you know, we could say that it's not just that he's a lonely man and he's not able to express something. That relationship to the hawk and the relationship to the dog are real relations, not simply in lieu of something else. That's what I'm contesting, okay? It's only if you agree that there's no other possibility than the hetero-homo binary that you will say he's doing this instead of that, okay? We don't know if he ever had sex with a boy he was very attached to the young son of a friend who came and visited him often in Ireland. We don't know if they had sex. We know that the boy went willingly and often. And because we now have a complete and utter prohibition on the idea of cross-generational relations, unless it involves a much older white man and a much younger white woman, and that's considered to be a reasonable relationship, um, because we're so absolutely opposed to the idea of you know a 50-year-old man and a 16-year-old boy, um, we, are, we are unable to judge that relationship anymore. But I will say that most relations from about 1890 to 1930 that we know about, that we do call homosexual, were cross-generational relations for women and men. And the generational difference supplied some of the difference that some people think were, might have been absent in the same-sex relationship. So whether he expressed those desires or not, we don't know, but he did express the desire for wildness that came from the training of the hawk, and he declared himself in love with this hawk over and over again. For Helen MacDonald, he's a bad falconer, he abuses the bird, 
he doesn't train it well, uh, and he is a uh, sort of a, a, a very bad sexual subject at the same time. And she, by comparison, is a good falconer. She mourns properly. She gets over her father, and by the end of the book, she's ready to resume dating men, we presume, um, and enter into sort of heterosexual uh, uh, normativity. So you can see, I'm trying to set up a different relationship between uh, queer and straight through the vector of the wild bird. Okay? All right. So just, um, you know, and we could just stay in the realm of falconry, but it's just to posit that there are alternative relationships to animals that are not exhausted by pet owning. Okay? Let's think about how we then came to own pets and start thinking about why we might want to have a critique of it. And this is just, that's the best moment of the secret life of pets, is when Snowball, played by Kevin Hart, who is a black actor, and so Snowball, the angry rabbit, um, is clearly identified as a, in fact, in the film, as a kind of black panther type uh, animal who's been abandoned by his uh, humans and has formed an underground group of resistant animals who want to rise up and kill their owners, which I thought was a great premise for the film, but they quickly abandoned that. But at any rate, <laughs> we do get this great slogan, liberated forever, domesticated never, suggesting you know, what um, um, being a pet might mean, in fact, uh, for animals. Uh, it means that you're, you, you lose your liberty. John Berger gives us an idea about why we started owning pets, and he writes that the practice of keeping animals, regardless of their usefulness, and this is something that Haraway harps on, is the usefulness of the animal. So regardless of the usefulness, the keeping exactly of pets, in the 16th century the word usually referred to a lamb raised by hand, is a modern innovation. And on the social scale on which it exists today, it is unique. It is part of that universal but personal withdrawal into the private, small family unit, decorated or furnished with mementos from the outside world, which is such a distinguishing feature of consumer societies. He also suggests that with the fall of the circus and the zoo and the critique of those institutions, the animal is taken out of the institution and brought into the home. Um, and there are many, many people who have, let's say, sociological or demographic critiques of pet owning too. And there's a, a geographer, uh, Heidi Nast, in Chicago, who's written a book about the demographic uh, way in which pets are distributed around cities, such that many um, childless white families have an abundance of pets, um, and many um, people living in poor areas uh, have one pet, but the pet is for security, and so is always outside and doesn't have the same relationship of intimacy to the family. And she shows that park areas that were previously for everyone are being taken over at an alarming rate for dog runs. And that's been my experience. Every place I've lived, I've moved into in L.A. when I lived in L.A., uh, a, park, a nearby park would quickly turn in the last 10 years from a park for everyone to a dog run littered with dog poop. Uh, and every morning, instead of you know people doing their calisthenics or exercise or just enjoying the space, it was all dogs all the time. And if you offer a critique of that, and this may happen in this room, people are just like, what's wrong with that? Well, there's a lot wrong with it because there are lots of other uses of public space other than simply running your dog. And especially in cities, you run the dog there because you put the dog at home in a tiny, tiny little apartment, and that's why it needs to run. So there's a kind of dynamic there about keeping animals in small spaces and then needing more and more space to run them outside that uses up public space. At the same time that we create these dog parks, we also uh, kick homeless people out of the park. So the park is okay for animals, but the park is not okay for people who may have uh, nowhere else uh, to go. And in LA, there was an area in Silver Lake where uh, you know one of the problems with LA maybe in Australia you can relate to this, many public spaces are unusable unless they have shade. Because it's too hot, you can't just stay out there with kids all day unless there's shade. The one area, the Silver Lake area, where there's shade is over the dog park. 
but the area for families and kids or picnic tables is completely unshaded. So I think this kind of calculation here about pets that takes its toll on public space and the sharing of public space that has gone unremarked upon because we have no critique of pet owning whatsoever. And then there's Chicken Run. I'm not sure what I want to say about Chicken Run. I always want to talk about Chicken Run, quite honestly. But uh, Chicken Run is just a, a brilliant uh, text um, in terms of the imagination of living alongside animals that not only don't want to be your pet, but deeply resent your presence, are um, uh, suffering as a consequence of human presence and are actively planning uh, escape. And uh, the, the best example of that, of course, um, is, is chicken run. Animal studies, however, I, I, I found at least one area of animal studies that has been deeply critical or, or let's say deeply imaginative about the possibilities of animal resistance. And here's just one example. This is from Jason Herbold's book um, on animal resistance, and he writes in a kind of nursery rhyme way that we usually use for children's books. Donkeys have ignored commands. Mules have dragged their hooves. Oxen have refused to work. Horses have broken equipment. Chickens have pecked people's hands. Cows have kicked her farmer's teeth out. Pigs have escaped their pens. Dogs have pilfered extra food. Sheep have jumped over fences. Okay, and it's this kind of trying to reverse the little myths that we tell each other about animals. He looks specifically at um, rampaging animals, and there are lots and lots of YouTube videos of rampaging animals. And he shows that anim uh, uh, elephants, elephants are so smart that often when they go on a rampage, they will move through a whole crowd of kids to find their trainer. And they pick the trainer up and bash their head in. Um, and if anyone's ever seen uh, Frederick Weissman's documentary Zoo, has anyone seen Zoo? It's one of those Weissman documentaries where there's no voiceover. You're just in the zoo for 24 hours. And it begins with this incredibly chirpy woman uh, training elephants to stand on tiny little platforms. And she, it's, a, it's a horrendous scene of human sadism. And when you watch that, you want to go watch a bunch of uh, YouTube videos of elephants uh, going after their trainers. So he makes the point, Jason Herbal does, that elephants are uh, completely aware of who their trainers are, seek them out, and um, uh, try to kill them. He uh, talks in terms of a, a kind of agency for such animals and uses James C. Scott's narrative uh, uh, or model of weapons of the weak to classify all kinds of animal actions that involve refusal, immobility, and menace as everyday forms of uh, resistance. And you could, you could think about animals using Spivak's terms as a kind of subaltern that cannot speak, and that therefore is expressing their refusal of human domination in forms of activity that are not speech. And I think that's what Herbal is doing. He's reading all kinds of animal activity as if it were speech, rather than seeing it as random, or a bad ele elephant, or a psychotic animal, he is reading it as very deliberate aggression on the part of um, animals against humans. I'm not going to play this clip because it's not much of a speech in the end. Um, well, let's see. Have a look. took out your own. Don't yeah, stupid owner. So that's that's who you're dealing with. So they um, they did not kill their owners, but Snowball's representing them as if they did to try to motivate the rest of the animals to rise up uh, against uh, their owners. And why is this not a good film? Because it sets that premise in, no, in motion only to abandon it halfway through the film by saying the animals aren't really mad with their owners. They just didn't want to be abandoned. And the conclusion of the film is that they all get taken back into human homes and everyone uh, lives happily ever after. That said, the little central moment that I just tried to give you a clip of, where the animals are gathering in the underground and plotting the overthrow uh, of human society, is quite powerful. Um, and you, know, you would think it had no place in a children's narrative. 
Um, but I think the, the, the logic of angry pets uh, is one that I want to develop then in this final section um, on a few other films that do take that premise to its conclusion. So has anyone seen this film, uh, White God? It's a Hungarian film about, no? About rebellious dogs? Okay, good. So this is a film, and you should watch it. It, it's, uh, it was made in Hungary. Um, it is a, a film about local dogs uh, um, rising up against a brutal system of dog catchers and uh, dog shelters that take the dogs off the streets, put them in prison-like environments, beat them or train them to dog fight. Um, and I'll play you a clip in a moment where you see the, the dogs just sort of deciding, oh no, we're not doing this. And you get these incredible scenes of the dogs running through the streets. Now the reading of the film was that it was just offering us a metaphor for social unrest in, in European cities in relationship to immigrants, and that this was a pure allegory in which the dogs represented, uh, uh, you know, sort of immigrant uh, subaltern uprisings. But I think you actually have to read it as being about dogs, and the, the film is very uh, sort of clear about that. Um, it, to me, it should be placed, in fact, in a longer tradition of films that have thrilled us and scared us about an organized animal resistance to human presence. And you only have to go back to the birds um, to think about how terrifying the idea was. And it was terrifying, if you remember in the film, because somebody said, well, it's just, it's, it's scary because there's just so many of them, you know? And the, the, the Hitchcock really, like, massages that idea by constantly having the birds massing. So in the 19, 1963, to have a film that was all about a recalcitrant, resistant uh, a group living among you who are massing and plotting and waiting for the moment to attack, I think was incredibly resonant. And again, we would say that it, and we have said that it was just a metaphor for something else, but in fact, what if it was part of this whole set of animal narratives that we've cultivated that are about animal attacks on human life? And I'll just play you this clip from White Heart. remarkable shot, right? Sh the, the camera's down low at the uh, level of the human, um, and you're not exempted from this rampage. You are in the position of the woman who's curled up. And if you think that the film s is sparing us the violence, as it does in this scene, it doesn't. It t the dogs go on a rampage starting then and tear up people's throats and do, uh, do not uh, find their former owners and then you know, become pliant again. They, they kill everything in sight, and it, it's, a, it's a beginning of a, a savage uh, rampage. And there are a couple of readings of it, and I'll, I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wind now, down now by saying that I would like to see us in animal studies move towards thinking about these very different relationships to animals, one that's figured through wildness, 
two that's figured through thinking uh, about the possibility of animal resistance, and three, to maybe depart a little bit from this model that we've been using of the companion species, um, where Haraway urges us to take dog-human relationships seriously and to contemplate the significant otherness of the dog, but then gives us a, 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 you know, a drawn-out account of dog training. And so the otherness of the dog is, is absolutely obliterated in this scene of training where she trains her dog, she exchanges kisses with the dog, remember that moment where she says they share DNA, um, but she would never endorse bestiality, although we could ask why not, if you're going to kiss the dog, if you're going to get into bed with the dog, if you're going to cuddle up with the dog, what's the difference? Why does it matter whether you have sex with it or whether you're kissing it? Quite honestly, kissing is often more intimate um, than the actual act of sex. So I would say we are romanticizing and sentimentalizing our relationships to animal through this narrative of companionship. There are lots of other films that do not romanticize um, this and like White Dog are quite engaged with both the sexual component of the potential relations between animals and humans and its wildness. And in this film in Germany by Nicolette Krebitz, this woman uh, falls in love with a wolf and develops a full-on suit that she can wear in order to have sex with the wolf without being mauled. This film was not released in the US. It was considered uh, too outrageous and controversial. Um, and then there's Wendy and Lucy. This is the American version. Um, and it, it is a beautiful film by Kelly Reichardt, who's known for what's called slow cinema, where it's a very slow film that's really beautiful about the relationship between a woman and a dog. But it, the intimacy is this. And again, we're asked to see this as not bestiality. We're drawing a line between sex and this kind of contact, which we see through the lens of sentimentality as acceptable, domesticated, intimate love, as opposed to sexual, erotic, demeaning, uh, oppressive. And I know many of us here probably kiss our dogs. I'm just saying, uh, what is the erotic status of those kisses? I, I, I don't know. I don't have a dog, don't kiss it, so I'm not sure. I wouldn't kiss a dog, um, probably for other reasons. But uh, I, I love it when people tell you, dogs are very clean. Have you seen what they pick up on the street? They're not clean. Don't kiss it. Um, let's move on from that, actually. Um, and this is the other person who I'm not sure about this book, and it's been immensely popular in critical animal studies. Um, uh, and she's an amazing writer, Colin Diane, uh, about histories of slavery in the Caribbean. But I, I think she's off on dogs. I do. This is a, a memoir written about living with dogs uh, at what she calls the edge of life. And she, she claims to write from the dog's perspective, as Haraway does, it compares the management of dangerous pit bulls which she is not in agreement with, to a Nazi euthanasia program, saying that our management and, and putting down of pit bulls is akin to the Nazi euthanasia program, I don't see that, and begins by her own admission to identify with animals over and against humans, and within a framework that, like Haraway's, mind you, is Christian. Okay, so she, she says, I am lost in the life of dogs, Everything I know of the spirit, I learned from them. Haraway says, I believe these theological considerations are powerful for knowing dogs, especially for entering into a relationship like training worthy of the name of love. And in both cases, the love is Christian love. Now, that doesn't immediately make it bad, but it does ask questions, uh, again, about this sentimental relationship that we're setting up to the animals and how it runs through the religious is quite interesting. And think about the fact that that animal film is called White God, and that God and dog are reverse, uh, you know, versions uh, of each other. Uh, the final thing I want to say about Colin Diane, and then I'll conclude, is that in this book, at one point, she goes on a trip to, to Haiti, which she writes about Haiti, so it's reasonable that she goes in. She sees dogs everywhere, dogs in the street, dogs without masters or without humans. And rather than seeing in these wandering dogs a different relationship to terrain and to the state and to the human and to ownership, she worries about the dogs. And she writes, quote, 
I'm not sure if I have a slide for this. Yeah, uh, that's the Christian thing. I'm lost in the life of dogs. These theological conditions. Here is the whole God is my pilot, dog is my co-pilot. You know, this this narrative is uh, using religious language all the time to set up the relationship between man and uh, dog. And this is what she writes when she sees the dogs on the streets of Haiti. Left alone on the gray stone floors with nothing inside, the dog has no bed, no blanket, nothing at all. I become a dog. I am the thing that brings me pain. Well, why should a dog have bed and blanket? And is it bad that a dog has no bed and blanket? Like, lots of animals live outside with no bed or blanket. <laughs> bed and blankets are human things. You know, the dog isn't going around, oh, who's going to give me a blanket? Where's my comfy mattress? Like, this is a total projection that the dog is somehow in, in, in a state of, uh, you know, neglect because there's no, no bed or mattress. So that's where the sentimentalization lies. A, the fantasy that we can imagine what the dog feels to the point where we're like, oh, that dog's sleeping on the floor. Dogs always sleep on the floor. Dogs aren't in nature looking for a comfy little pillow. You know, I mean, dogs are out there at the edge of life, as she says. Okay, so in conclusion, and this is the last scene of uh, White uh, God, and the dogs return to the little girl, Hagen. Hagen, the dog, uh, uh, returns to the girl, and instead of rebonding with her, she lies down with the dogs. So it's not, the dogs don't lie down uh, to pay some sort of homage to her. She lies down to get down to the level of the dogs, but knows that the bond is absolutely broken. There is no return. So the film ends with a clear question, and it's a question that I want to end with, that I believe lies at the heart of what I'm calling animal anarchy. What if we're not the authors of revolution at any given moment, but the masters who must be overthrown? Alright, probably wasn't that controversial, but uh, I know there might be people with dogs who, uh, you know, I, I'm not, a, yeah, I'm not a dog person, no, I'm not a cat person either, before you ask, no cats, no animals in the house, uh, except the ones I don't know about, and I really want to not know about them. Um, <laughs> And it's not that I don't like them, I just wonder about this domesticated relationship in the home with them. Comment? Yeah, okay. I, I mean, it, throughout history, humans have had, before we lived in cities, yeah. we did live with animals for yeah. a very long time. So sure. It's actually quite a modern thing not to live with animals. Actually, I think part of liking animals is really quite genetic. I think there's a big, strong genetic component to that. Because that's what our ancestors did, and sure. a lot of animals that we have domestically, that we've domesticated and selected and bred, we've bred them to like us, yeah. to require a bed and all these creature comforts. That's right. And you know the pushed-in face of, of some dogs that have a narrow visual field to respond to our facial cues. There's a lot in there, and and now there's the whole neglect of pets and puppy farming and all these other issues that um, I think we're sort of failing to recognise. And I, I guess are you familiar with the domestication of, of cats, of, of them domesticating to us? And there's a really interesting evolutionary history about that. And that we've, we've picked those, them as a, as a target animal to keep rodents down. There's actually a lot of animals that can keep rodents out of our yeah. houses and things. Yeah, sure. I mean, we did lots of things in the past that we don't have to do now. I mean, when we lived with animals in the past, we lived very differently. Yeah, of course, but I think this is strong. This is a strong, sure, there might well be a strong instinct to do it, but when I'm living in New York City and I know that the person walking that massive dog might well be going home to a very small apartment, we begin to lose the plot a little bit on, you know, what that animal is doing in that space. You know, you want to live in the urban area, but you want to have the dog. Are these desires, however programmed they might be, are they incompatible at a certain point? Um, and then, you know, I know a lot of my neighbors, literally that dog goes outside twice a day to poop. And it, it's like, that's what it's going outside for. 
uh, especially in New York City, because there's not tons of places to do something with a dog in New York City. I know, I know the dog parks, they just smell like urine. Yeah. They're terrible. Terrible. They're so, <laughs> I'm not saying that no one should ever live with an animal, but you know, a lot of people who live in rural areas with animals, they don't have the animal in the house. They don't have to. The animal can be outside. Uh, the, the, they, they live with dogs, and the dog is an outside animal. The cat is an outside animal. So the, I think John Berger is right that a shift occurs in the 20th century that is worth noting. So even though that history is there, that history does not e explain the modern relationship to animals in the home. That's what I would say. And the way that we've tried to explain it leaves me a bit baffled. Um, well, I want to pick you up uh, two things. Um, one, them saying that animal studies romanticise animals. I mean, in critical animal studies, quite the, um, we yeah. romanticise. In fact, our position would be great. Let's get rid of the um, pet industry. Is is it's for all the reasons you said? And yeah. You know, capitalism and so on. Um, and you know, that's Gary Francioni. Um, that's a lot of what he's been talking about as well. So it's quite a Gary what? Francioni is. Um, you know, taking with a grain of salt. Yeah. It's like, you know, no, so. animal studies kind of... Um, yeah. But, yeah, so there's, there is a huge um, yeah. field around that and, yeah. and a lot of the critiques you've raised. The other thing I was thinking about in terms of the resistance, I don't know if you've read um, Dinesh Wadiwell's work. Yeah, I've published a piece of his in oh, the right. issue of Wildness, Wildness, I have it in here, right. that he writes about chicken resistance in mm. um, uh, packing industries, yes. Mm. But I guess for him, one of the big things of resistance is then that's actually what's used against animals. Yeah. Um, in the slaughterhouse, um, their resistance is then um, is, is then used as a way to target them. Um, you know, for example, he talks about fish and yeah. the way that fish resist. Um, and so on the way that we make a hook um, is so that, that, because we know that they don't want to get killed, right? right? We know an animal doesn't want to get killed, so we make the barb backwards on a hook so the fish can't get off, exactly. um, off the hook. And so actually, Within that um, resistance, we're actually saying that we know animals want to live, and we're killing them anyway. Right. Um, and that's yeah, anyway, that's such an important part. Of it. Right. And then think about somebody like Temple Grandin, you exactly. know, yeah, who has uh, made really an amazing name for themselves, not only uh, in relation to autism, but because you know she was able to intuit what it was that made cattle. Um, frisky when they were being led to the slaughter and was able to eliminate all of the things that the cattle were responding to which means that now they just go to the slaughter supposedly happily and this is supposed to be like a, a big a great development and I know she is often picketed by animal rights people um, you know and I, I think I'm in somewhere in between like I'm not com I am critical of that piece but I think that there is some interesting stuff that she uh, says uh, in terms of her relationship to how she imagines animals see the world that is quite different from some other work. Um, but yeah, no, I get that it's not all romanticism, uh, and I know that, but in general in the society we live in, pet owning is romanticized on the one hand, and then on the other hand, I think the domination of the companion species model, uh, I don't know what how critical animal studies receives Haraway's later work, yeah. But when species meet too, I think these are these are quite romantic, sentimentalizing, and avowedly Christian texts. And there's something about the the orientation to Christianity, I think, that has set up a kind of theological relationship to animals, or a theology within which the relationship between the human and the animal is is understood in a kind of great chain of being way, you know. Yeah, I mean, and also Haraway's talking about purebred dogs. Right, so. right. And with Colin <coughs> Diane, you know, for her to be saying that um, managing dangerous pit bulls is akin to Nazi euthanasia, but not talking about the fact that pit bulls are often bred a certain way. I mean, that's the manip genetic manipulation, right? It's the breeding of the pit bull or the German shepherd or whatever for security purposes that we might associate with a, a heinous ideology rather than the idea of, I mean, culling pit bulls that have been bred to have broad mouths, broad jaws, and serve as um, protection, I, I, don't, I don't see the connection at all to Nazi euthanasia. And again, Colin Diane is seen as a very interesting critical voice in this, 
in this uh, conversation. But I'd love to, if you have more suggestions for me to read, that would be great. Yes. Well, thank you so much for your talk. I really enjoyed um, the intersections between falconry and, um, and queer sexuality, which was an eye-opener for me. So yeah, okay. really interesting. Thank you for that. And I just wanted to add to what Jess said about um, critical animal studies generally really rejecting um, pet ownership. In fact, one of the troubling questions is what we do with rescue animals yeah. uh, and, and the conditions of you know care for rescue animals. I think Laurie Bruin's Entangled and Empathy, or yeah. not Entangled Empathy, Ethics of Captivity yeah. talks a little bit about that. Exactly. Yeah. Talks a little bit about that. Um, but I just wanted to draw your attention. I was interested in what you said about how um, dogs, I mean, you know, um, in I think you quoted the example of LA where uh, dogs are privileged yeah. uh, members or, or citizens of, of <coughs> park users right. or homeless humans. And I, 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 I might uh, send you some really interesting feminist geographical work, which actually draws these really inter inter interesting um, intersections of care. They're drawing in poverty studies and feminist care ethics together okay. to demonstrate the kind of relationships that homeless people have with homeless sure. dogs. Right. And how these sorts of ethics of care are really important in also navigating these public spaces and ownerships, and how different um, concepts of poverty as it is applied to both human home ownership and property status of dogs kind of intersect in really troubling and fractured ways mm, uh, yeah. to displace both homeless humans as well as homeless dogs. That would be amazing to have yeah. that because the talk that I gave yesterday was all about real estate capitalism and the displacement awesome. okay. um, of, uh, you know, the, the absolute ruination of the possibility of not, not o even owning a home, but yeah. even living in a place for a reasonable exactly. amount of money yeah. and how that's part of a, a massive sort of global calculation. Yeah. Uh, and so to be able to find the link to animals would be really helpful for me. I'll, I'll, I'll get that to you. Thank <laughs> you so much. No Thank you. Yes. A lot of white owners are what? Bring their dogs to come and poo on the ground. Yeah. Of how you live. Oh, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I just wonder if you could sort of just take that as a. Well, that's what I was trying to say about the demographics, and it will be interesting to see how that um, matches up with um, some of the work that you were talking about. Um, I'm saying that at the same time that there's a kind of uh, devastation, if you like, or a, a, a complete abandonment of the, even the idea of public space and public housing and public assistance of any kind, um, there's also this investment in animal life on the part of uh, often white couples with or without children. And I think that, you know, if you think of Mike Davis's book on LA, he, he charts in meticulous detail the way in which uh, public areas in LA in the 1980s and 1990s were, were um, reimagined so that homeless people could never find a place to sit in them and there were like spikes put on benches and uh, division, the benches were divided so you could never lie down on them. And I think this is a new but more ben seemingly benign version of that which is taking public space that people might be using for all kinds of things and that homeless people might be using, for example, to sort, sort their recycling or pitch a tent or whatever in an absolutely unaffordable housing market, for those areas to be now legally fenced off because they're dog areas, I just, I'm not sure if I can completely make sense of that except to stupidly just keep pointing at it, that we're turning <coughs> public areas into dog runs and that allows us to then put in gates fences, enclose them in that <coughs> quintessentially capitalist way, and at the same time, we are um, further dis disenfranchising homeless people and squeezing um, often poor people, often people of color, out of um, other kinds <coughs> of housing and other access uh, to public areas. So I think that the relationship to race is sort of spatial and demographic, and because it's that way, we don't think that pet owning has anything to do with race, right? But there's some, many studies show that in a poor neighborhood, and often specifically among African-American families, 
you know, the, 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 the danger in their neighborhoods, often from police, is so high that the dog is there for security. The dog is there to make sure that no officials come in the yard to take kids away, to inspect uh, the rental property, to arrest somebody or whatever. So the fact that we're, people are using dogs in such different ways, but even in the example you gave, it's spatial. It's like white leisure and white casual intimate investments uh, literally produce waste that is being dumped in an area of town that has been specifically designated uh, as part of a, a black college campus or something. I mean, that gives you the exact spatial dimensions of uh, you, you know, what, what the relationship might be between white pet owning and um, black impoverishment. Yes? Thank you so much for that very exciting work. Um, okay, so I'm, a, I'm owned by a cat. I don't own a cat. She moved in, she was feral, and she just moved in. Um, and that happens a lot with cats. And I was really interested in this, um, this work that, that you're, talk, you're touching on, this the combination of Christianity and dogs, because mm. cats are more often associated yeah. with witches. Witches, yeah, and that's I, right. And I happen to be one. So, <laughs> so the, the witch is also very mm. wild, right? I mean, she yeah. has sex with a born god, then he's a goat. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I want to link it into some conversation that's been happening in Australia, long term, but very hot topic right now about the killing of feral cats. Like mm. we allow people to just go out and shoot cats because mm. cats are not okay. But we don't actually do the same for dogs, even though you know mm. we still have problems with dogs. To us, we allow ourselves to do certain things to dogs, but not like with cats. And I feel like cats are almost by definition, anarchist. Yeah, <laughs> like, right. cannot be ruled. No. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. And I think any cat owner will tell you that, right? Like, it's yeah, a I think. Different relationship. You know, there was a a, yeah, a project like, with um, and there are lots of projects with. Yeah. There's lots of projects with pet cams, you know, and they put a pet cam on, on all kinds of cats and found out that lots of cats have lots of homes. <laughs> so you think it's your cat, but that cat is in many other neighborhoods and many other houses eating many other people's food. Right, so I, I like, you know, you're right, there's a kind of wandering capacity to the cat, but also, yeah, the relationship to the witch is really, really interesting. Um, and I think there's quite, uh, there's a, a bit of a return, in fact, to thinking about witchcraft precisely because we are so dominated by the pharmaceutical industry now that, you know, Paul Preciado and Testo Junkie reminds us that people who were called witches in the 15th century were people who just knew things about medicinal herbs and plants that the state, the emergent state, wanted to capitalize on. And we see the other end of that now with the pharmaceutical industry. So there's a lot of interest in witchcraft, and I think you're pointing to another area that could be, you know, productive, generative to think about, which is these intimate relations between people who are outcast and then these these animals that are often cast as being quite um, not not just extra human but unworldly, unworldly in some way. Yeah, I mean, we could go through every animal. So you know, if someone's about to do their budgery, you know, let's do that. But. Uh, it, Clearly, we've taken up different relations to different animals, and I get that there are different histories of domestication. Um, but there also is this thing where we reduce all our household animals to that term pet. And that's, that's the piece that I'm sort of pushing on. Mm -hmm. Is there somebody over here? Yes. Oh, I had a question. Um, thank you, first of all. Uh, your observations about living in New York and knowing the dog that goes out <laughs> twice a day, yeah. for example, and I thought, well, I've been outside only twice a day myself. Uh, it wasn't to go to the bathroom. Right. <laughs> it, it was, you know, like my, um, I guess I was wondering if you ever thought about recasting this relationship in terms of um, not ownership, but it, regardless if we have these domestic animals now that we live with often, um, but we also live there, like we live in the tiny boxes. We only go out twice yep. a day, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and so recasting that relationship in terms of solidarity and that perhaps mm -hmm. some of our struggles actually we share with our pets, regardless of how we may have very much made those, but they are here now, and, mm. and no. why can't we live outside? <laughs> Yeah, kind of you know, in, in, in my book, I sort of cast the animal as part of what, uh, uh, sort of subject to something I call zombie humanism, which is 
the tendency of humans to arrogate liveliness, liveliness only to itself, and then everything else is a sort of living dead accessory. And that's how I think about the pet, is as a kind of, as an accessory that you want to pet or cuddle or have some sort of non-human communication with, but is also a distraction and an annoyance and is something that you have to walk in and, and poop and feed and then take it to the vet and give it ridiculous surgeries and so on. So I, I, I think that in another world where we set up pets, a relationship to the pet differently, I think we could talk about solidarity, but I think in the world that we live in with pet industries, we've reduced animals to a kind of living death sometimes. And that's what I'm using that example to suggest, that it's not... You know, do, do you guys remember the Monty Python skit with the parrot where, uh, you know, John Cleese goes to the pet shop with a dead parrot in his cage and he's like, I'd like to return this. And the shop owner is like, why? And he's like, it's dead. And he's like, no, it's not. It's just asleep, you know. And I think all pets in some way are dead. That's why the shop owner is like, that's what a pet is. Just take it home and hang it up. It's, it's lovely. It might sing, it might not. You never know, right? So, uh, you know... And I know that that's not anyone's relationship to their pet. I get that. But I think it's part of the way in which we've convinced ourselves that we're good. Um, that's why I'm calling it zombie humanism. We're good. We rescue animals. You cannot, this is part of my ethos of zombie humanism, you cannot rescue the very thing that you put in danger in the first place. You're only rescuing the animal because a human life has put it at danger, has put it at risk. So the whole fantasy of rescue is predicated upon a good human, not the bad human, who got the pet and then abandoned it. And it allows you to think about your relationship in humanitarian terms. You know, it's like Western nations saying we're going to send aid to the country that we just colonized. You're not sending aid. You sh let's call it reparations. How about that? You know, think about the French relationship to Haiti, since we were talking about Haiti a minute ago. You know, Haiti is still in debt because after the slave rebellions, it had to pay reparations to France because it had removed a source of revenue from the French crown by, you know, no longer supplying France with slaves. So I think that's the, that's the system that I'm... I, I don't have a brain big enough to make the proper connections between the, the sort of... Uh, these fantasies of humanism that fuel human rights, humanitarianism, and all of those other versions of the human that we've been critical of, but I believe we find a small kernel of that in the relationship between the human and the pet. Um, and so that's, that's why I'm not sure about the solidarity, even though I'd like to go there with you. Yeah. Yeah, I just um, wanted to add that there's, like, plenty of good reasons why we have to kill cats in Outback Australia um, and it's like uh, it's very like situational so like for instance there's lots of places where they eat dogs and there's um, lots of places where wild urban dogs are a problem um, like in India for instance um, but I also I mean yeah, yeah. I was also going to um, talk about or just raise the idea of um, urban bees and beekeeping in urban spaces yeah. is something that kind of blurs a lot of these things. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, because they are sort of undomesticatable. Yeah, um, right. And we, we don't need to uh, often tend to them, um, but they're being welcomed into more and more urban spaces. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that seems to... I mean, that's not pet owning, is it? That's more that models a different relationship to animals that we have put at risk and that we have largely eliminated their habitat or we have um, endangered through monoculture uh, uh, in terms of their pollination routes. Um, so that would be a different relationship where we return to the idea that we have to, we have to rejuvenate habitat or we have to re you know, recreate possibilities for uh, the life of bees. Um, that seems to me to be connected to a very different relationship to animal life and one that many uh, people are trying to think through. Um, and are, I think people are deep, you know, extremely aware of the fact that we have eaten up all kinds of habitat and 
are trying to figure out how you can welcome back the creatures that 50, 60 years ago people were running off. But the other thing about eating animals, I just want to say something about too, because it, it's linked to that last point about this humanitarian fantasy that we have. I was at an event, when I started thinking about all this stuff, I was at an event in London at the Serpentine that they have every year. And every year the Serpentine sponsors these marathons, and they're built around a theme. And this year it was on extinction. So everyone gets to give a little 10 minute presentation. And mine was at like, you know, 11 at night or something. So I had the whole day to listen to people presenting. Most of the presentations were on um, how terrible it was that people in, mostly the, the, the critique was of China, that people in China are eating endangered animals. And that the trade in endangered animals for Asian cuisine, for the purposes of supplying Asian cuisine, um, was something that we had to stop. And then there was all this earnest, like, hand-wringing about how we can intervene. There was zero narrative, however, about colonialism, which is really, you know, like, the Chinese trade in animals has not, is not responsible for, you know, the extinction of many species and the endangerment of others. It's, we know that it's about environmental decline, colonialism, uh, m mono cropping, uh, y you know, the absolute uh, erasure uh, of huge habitats and so on. But that narrative was easily at hand and was repeated throughout the day. And that's where I, so then that's why I, I posited this zombie humanism that's always sort of looking for uh, the answer elsewhere rather than taking on the responsibility through these systems that we already know and have theorized, like colonialism, um, that is ready at hand to explain exactly how it is that we, we have cast certain cultures as irresponsible in their eating practices because they eat things that we uh, don't eat. Uh, and this then becomes a very handy uh, narrative. And I think that's partly where I'm, I'm making a very small intervention. I'm not an animal studies person. I'm not really even a critical animal studies person. I'm someone who's trying to think about our, crit our critical and epistemological relationship to wildness as a concept and the way in which that gets played out partly through our relationship to the pet. Uh, and, you, you know, so it was like 11 o'clock at night and I could see like a couple of people in the room were like, wow, that's the first time we've been talking about colonialism the whole day and we're talking about extinction? This is insanity, right? But there it was and this was considered to be an edgy event. So I think... I think my work is often trying to push back on intuitive narratives and make the connections that I can't necessarily always follow through on, but I can at least point to about where we might look for some different kinds of answers. Can I just follow yeah, quickly? Yeah. Um, are you, I'm not sure if um, you've read or familiar with you, probably got um, Deborah Bird Rose's work yes, on, 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 on wildness. Yeah. 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 yeah, which we were talking about this in the workshop the other day, which. <coughs> really attributes wildness to the colonizer, whereas I'm trying to take back the concept of wildness as a kind of uh, critical political you know, name for a set of strategies and identifications that fall outside of um, uh, the conventional. Yeah, where she uses the term wildness for the brutality of colonizing forces. Yeah, but thank you for that. Zombie humanism is a wonderful concept, by the way. I'll be using that in my work. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you may have mentioned this, but uh, who's publishing your book and when's it out? <laughs> uh, Duke's publishing it, um, and it's it, at the moment it's in two volumes. The first one is on these sort of modernist narratives about the relationships between children and animals, the falconry chapter, uh, fantasies of the wild and colonialism, the life of Pi, uh, where the wild things are, that kind of thing. And then the second book is on. Uh, anarchy and you know what I was talking about last <coughs> night which is a kind of unbuilding of the world that's connected to the work on wildness in that it, it runs counter to the direction of development that we've been so engaged in. So when will it be out? I'm not sure because people keep objecting to it when it goes for the reader reports. People are like, no, you know, this person is completely wrong about pets or uh, I just seem to be hitting enough nerves that, that people say no to it and I'm not willing to change it so um, I think it'll be out within a year or so that's it yeah. um, we are just coming up to seven so I might just leave it on that 
wonderful yeah. note of positive forward thinking. Thank you so much, everybody.